example of the code of conduct, have the integrity and wisdom to consider the matters before us honestly, graciously, and for the greater good of the town. Thank you. So welcome everyone to the October Ordinary Council meeting. Um, and as many of you be aware, it's really important um, practice for the town to at every meeting for us to again acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, that being the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and to acknowledge that our town was founded on the lands of those people. And to just be reminded of their importance to our history, but also to our present and our future as a community. Um, so to start off with tonight, I am uh, delighted to introduce you all to our new CEO, Mrs Peter Mabs, who started with the town just yesterday after um, Mr Bob Jarvis departed last Friday after nearly 10 years of service. Um, so as many of you would know, over um, the last few months we've been going through a lengthy recruitment process and I think, uh, and I'm sure many of you would agree, that appointing the CEO is one of the most, if not the most important decisions that we will make as a council because that individual is responsible for delivering the vision of council and the community and we are really pleased um, to have Peter on board. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Brown and Councillor Hamilton in particular who have assisted over the last few months being on the recruitment um, committee and Jeff Blades who was the recruitment consultant that worked with us during that period. Um, we were specifically seeking uh, a progressive CEO who was going to help us to realise the vision for our community and um, I think Peter really fits that, that bill. Um, we had a lot of interest in the position which was really encouraging. We had 88 applicants from very high calibre um, people um, but going through that process um, Peter was the unanimous choice of council at last month's meeting uh, so we're really delighted to welcome you on board Peter. So some of you may have read some of this in the media release, but those of you that haven't had the ability <coughs> to hear some of Peter's background, I'll just read some of it out for you and then I'll give Peter the chance to say a few words herself. Um, so as I said, Peter is an experienced transformational leader. Um, she's had chief executive officer experience and she's got postgraduate qualifications in public sector management, policy and public administration. She's also an Executive Fellow of the Australian and New Zealand School of Government and has previously been honoured with the title of Female Administrator of the Year, which is very impressive. Um, Peter's had a 34-year career working with the state government across agencies responsible for justice, policing, child protection, corruption and integrity, land information, housing and communities, and all of them have really critical links to the community, which is obviously what we're about serving here as well. Um, Peter's got a strong corporate governance and integrity background and until this appointment had been playing a key role in the independent inquiry into the City of Perth. Um, Peter also has a very personal connection to the town. Some of you may have, um, may know her family and know Peter from when she was living here in her younger, in her younger days. Um, and it's really clear from my contact with Peter that she's got a real love for this community as well, which I think is a, a really important thing coming into this role. Um, so as I said, we're really thrilled to have Peter on board and we're confident that her experience and her passion for this area is going to serve our community well. So Peter, once again, um, welcome and um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to say anything that you would like to, to oh, say at this you. point. No, thank you, Renee. Um, <clears throat> I can't emphasise enough how privileged and honoured I am to be here as the Chief Executive Officer for the Town of Bassendee. As Renee mentioned, um, I, I do have strong connections to the area. My family's had a history in Bassendine since the 1940s when my grandparents um, came to the area and they had a dairy farm up on Penzance Street. Um, my parents bought their first home here. I bought my first home here. I no longer live in the area, but certainly that first 30 years has, I think, really shaped who I am. Um, I've, I've had the benefit of uh, being involved in the community and getting to know many of the community members and families. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with the community but also a really passionate and committed council and a dedicated team of staff as well. Um, I think we're all working collectively towards the same things and that, that's a great future for the town of Bassendean but also one that we're really proud to uh, leave to the next generation as well. So thank you very much. Thanks Renee. Welcome Peter. So I have another um, introduction to do tonight. So we have another special person who's joining us this evening. Um, and this is Michael Hinn. I'm sorry if I didn't say that exactly correctly, Michael. So Michael is a recipient. You can just wait a minute. I'll, I'll call you off in a minute, Michael. Um, so Michael is a recipient of the Junior Sports Achievement Award. Um, 
So Michael was selected to represent WA in the Goldfields under 13 state team in October and he travelled to compete in the 2018 National Youth Championships which were held in Coffs Harbour in New South Wales. So this is um, Australia's premier soccer competition where talented players compete for over a five day period. Um, so it sounds like Michael did very well. Uh, he was one of 17 people, I think, selected out of 400, which is really an amazing achievement. Um, and the first time Michael travelled into state, so that was an exciting adventure as well. Um, his team finished third in his category, which in their group, which was an excellent achievement and something to be proud of. And I think Michael is um, already had his has his sights set on. Um, next year competing again and has high hopes for the future. So Michael, we're really um, proud to have you as a member of the Bassendine community and thank you for representing Bassendine so well and we look forward to seeing your progress um, as a sportsman and an ambassador for the town of Bassendine into the future uh, and we wish you very well um, for your future achievements. So if you would like to come up, I would love to present you with the award and is someone going to be taking your yep, photo, sure. Graham? <laughs> So you can maybe come over here. So on behalf of the town of Bassendine, I'd love to present you with this award. So that's somebody, and here's your certificate. They're going to turn And just talking to Michael and his mum beforehand, it turns out my mother-in-law was his pre-primary teacher at Eden Hill School. So I love those things about our community where there's all these connections between people. It's really wonderful. Um, so before we move on, I just wanted to remind um, everybody who's in attendance that our meetings are now live streamed. So they're not only recorded, they're also uploaded onto the internet and available um, through live streaming. Hopefully the audio is working tonight. We had a bit of a hiccup last time. Um, so just for members of the public who stand up and ask questions, you just wanted to make you aware that that is publicly available um, via the internet. Um, and lastly, before we move on, I just wanted to bring people's attention to item 10.6, which was the RFQ for the provision of high speed um, connectivity. So that item's been withdrawn from the agenda tonight. Okay, so moving on to item two, which is public question time. Um, so as always, we've got uh, 50, we have 15 minutes of public question time. Um, if you would like to ask a question in a moment, I'll ask you to raise your hand and then when you're called, you can come to the microphone. Uh, please remember to state your name and your address for the record. If you have a comment to make, can you please just hold off until the public question time is finished because then there'll be the opportunity for statements to be made about <coughs> specific agenda items on um, that we'll be dealing with this evening. So to start off with, um, public question time, Mr. Um, Pearson, um, Mr. Pearson, would you like to come up first? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I find myself in somewhat. Uh, oh, Peter Pearson, 14 River Street, Dustin Day. I find myself in a somewhat <coughs> unusual position tonight, having spent years pleading with the council to get on and uh, <laughs> modify the, the town planning scheme. I now uh, and do it as quickly as possible. I now find myself here leading you uh, with you to slow down. <laughs> my, my question tonight is, will the council extend the time allowed for public consultation so that residents may be properly informed before they're asked for feedback? And an ancillary to that, will the council provide significantly more detail or background information uh, to expand on the associated key design principles than with that which is currently available in the attachments for item 10.2? And my comments there is that something that came in very clearly from the recent land court uh, exercise, I won't call it consultation, um, was so one of the main things that Bassendine residents like is the green and leafy nature of the suburb. So, so just before you ask your second question, I will just respond to that one. So thank you. And um, I'm not sure if you were able to hear from the briefing session because the, the audio was out, as you're aware, and I know you turned up to try and listen last week. Um, so there were quite a few questions last week from councillors around this item. Um, obviously, when it comes to that item, councillors will have the ability to move the OSA recommendation on alternative. As I've said to you, I've had some discussions with both 
um, the CEO and the Director of Strategic Planning, and my intention is to move a deferral motion on that item for some of the reasons that you just identified. Could, could I just in conclusion throw to you your, your own <laughs> design group's comment? Um, <laughs> that's, this, is from, this, is, this is the uh, member of your uh, design uh, group, and this is his, him, not me. The communications and engagement with the community at this stage are critical. We need communi the community to be on board and not to feel as though this is a fait accompli. The built form design policy, in my opinion, needs to come first or concurrently with the design maps, uh, with the density maps, and I can only second that, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much for your comments. Mr Bridges. <coughs> Paul Bridges, Paul Bridges, 150 West Road, Bassendean. Um, uh, my question um, partially relates to the motion that um, uh, our Mayor has put up uh, for, for this evening on the street trees in, uh, in, in Old Perth Road. But um, prior to the last meeting, I submitted some um, notice of questions that I was going to ask, and I've had <coughs> answers to those in writing. So, so I just you have had answers? I have had answers, yep. thank you, and I appreciate that. Um, I have a, a quick, and I've had some subsequent questions that I've, um, I've, I've posed and circularised to all councillors. Um, one of the questions that I asked uh, was, um, given council's commendable target of 70% shade coverage for road reserves, have the town's tree maintenance contracts been informed the practice of lollipopping street trees is to cease? And the, res the written response reads, the tree maintenance tender documents um, outlines the guidelines for the flat top and U and L shaped canopy pruning under power lines. And then it goes on, the specifications state that the lollipop that the lollipopping method is not permitted as the town wants to see the sides of the canopy increase to the road edge and the property boundary. Now my question is, does that mean that when contractors come in to prune under power lines that they actually prune the tree to the property boundary and to the edge of the road and if that's the case why are we you know how are we ever going to achieve 70% coverage within our road reserves if everything's trimmed to the the, the road edge and so and I would point out that there is absolutely no need to prune to the road edge because that's done by furniture vans Okay, so maybe I'll just, <laughs> I'll, I'll just direct that question to Mr Stuart Dawkins. Yes. Thank, you for the, thank you for the question. Um, yes, look, the, the, as you've written out, as you read out the, the, co the contract does require the contractor to prune the road edge, but if, if, if it's above the height of a, the vehicles, then the canopy is allowed to grow, grow above that. It's just to prevent vehicles <coughs> from when driving down the road, not being clipped by the branches as they're as they're driving, so that's it. It's, it's uh, the, the tree will be permitted to grow over the over the uh, the road surface once they're above the canopy height. My, my question was: Do the contractors prune to the the, the road edge? Um, when they're when they're pruning under So I heard lines. the answer to be they prune to the road edge to a certain height and then once above the height yes. that needs clearance for a tree uh, for a truck then it will be allowed to yeah, stand great. over the road. All right. If, if, if I might, the the thing is, if you just let the tree grow naturally, um, passing traffic knocks the tips off anything that's growing out over the road edge. Anyone who drives down Gilbert Road will see the clear <coughs> L shape of. Um, of sea containers that have been brought through on trucks or furniture vans. So there's absolutely no need to pay contractors to prune to the road edge. The vehicles do that. And the trees respond by not, not growing branches out that will interfere with, with, um, with road traffic. Okay, so do, you have, do you have another question, Mr Bridges? No. No? Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Mr White. <coughs> Uh, David White, 49 7th Avenue, Bassendean. I also find myself in an unusual situation and I've never been to a council meeting before. Welcome. <laughs> and I, I might add that I've given my only copy of my question to the minutes clerk. Oh dear. But I will wing it, okay? It was a very simple question. It's not a maths question or anything. Um, my, well, it is a maths question, actually. My question is, how much money has been spent on weed control on Success Hill Reserve? That's my first question. I have a second question. Um, so I saw your question in advance of the meeting and I've already run it past Mr Stuart Dawkins who's responsible for that area and he doesn't have that information on hand at the moment so he's going to take that on notice and we'll provide you with that information when he's able to get it soon. Thank you. Yeah, Thank and you. a second question? Uh, my second question is um, how effective has this 
um, weed treatment been? So are you able to provide a response about what weed, tre weed treatment has been undertaken and any measures of success that we have? Uh, yes, there's been, there's been some, over the last couple of years, there's been some trials that have been undertaken uh, at Success Hill, particularly adjacent to or, or in the vicinity of the, uh, the road. Um, the, we've had uh, varying levels of success. Uh, we, we have been undertaking an assessment of, of the, the weed treatments and um, there's been a, a, an increase in the weeds closer to the road a area with the treatments that we've been doing. The areas where we've been treating closer to the river, river on the riverside, um, we've had an improvement in the quality of the bush there uh, because we've been using um, some selective herbicides and different types of treatments in that area. So um, we've seen a, a quite a big improvement in the, the, the bush areas to, to the uh, to the east side of Brazil. Mr Stuart Dawkins, I believe you've supplied council previously with um, the, I forget what it's called, the scale that you use to rate. Yes. Um, is that information able to be provided yes, to Mr White as well? Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, yeah, sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Justin Hughes. Oh, that's right, come up. <coughs> Mr Hughes. Yep. It's uh, Justin Hughes from 42 Reeds Street, Bassanine, on behalf of the Eastern Regional RSL, Deputy Vice President, and I've got Dave Beach also. So, um, what I'd like to do is table a letter stating that I've been given authority to act on behalf of the Eastern Regional Bassanine RSL by President Ashley Vince. So, um, Madam May, do, you, do I have your permission to do this? Uh, so, so, you want to read out the letter? Oh, yeah, yep. yep. So, to my concern, please be advised that this letter gives authority to Justin Hughes to act on behalf of the President Ashley Vincent in dealings with the Town of Bassendine, City of Swan, City of Bayonne, and the RSL Western Australia, and any other organisation dealing with veterans. Okay. Yeah. And did you have a specific um, comment or question in relation to that, or you just wanted to present us? Um, yes, there, there yeah. is a yeah, follow on for that. Um, my next point is myself and Dave Beecham attended a meeting on the 28th of September with Sue Perkins, Bob Jarvis and Simon Stuart Dawkins mm -hmm. um, relating to the 11th of November Remembrance Day 2018 and we were informed during the meeting that we no longer lease the property next to the Bassendine RSL Lot 41 179 Guilford Road that the lease had expired some time ago. Um, obviously, this I'm being proactive now, we've got a couple of questions so Dave can read them. <coughs> Okay, thank you. I'm David Beecham. I'm from the Eastern Regional RSL, which is at 10 Kenny Street in Bassendine. Um, a couple of questions. I'm hoping this is the right forum to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. The land next to the RSL, which is Lot 41, 179 Guildford Road, was on a peppercorn lease to the Eastern Regional RSL. The lease expired. Um, we're not sure whether the RSL was actually notified that the lease was up and that there was a vote, and did that happen? Okay, I'm not sure who's best to answer that question. Can one of the staff, Mr Haggart? Um, no, no vote was taken. Certainly once the lease lapses, um, then we go, go into a negotiation again. Council would make a determination at that time whether or not um, it's uh, interested in an alternative purpose. Um, should it decide that um, it's happy to continue with the same purpose, then we would uh, look to renegotiate a lease with you. Okay, can I just, um, on that note, we were told there was a vote. The land on the corner of Kenny Street and um, Guildford Road is now listed as public open space. And that was a vote taken by the council. That's the only place. No, no vote taken by the council. Um, the land has always been, um, yeah, Brian was standing so to, yeah. to give the same answer. I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the answer so far, so we're doing good. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Reid, would like to... I'm a, a town planner. I'm just part of, I think it was Amendment 9 to the local planning scheme number 10 last year. That land was zoned for housing. It is now zoned for parks and recreation. OK. Um, so just at this point, I'll, I'll allow you to ask one final question and then we'll see if there's others that have questions. Sure. And can the Bassendine Council um, re-enter into, a, can the, the Eastern Regional RSL um, re-enter into a peppercorn lease for that land um, on the corner of <coughs> Kenny Street and, um, uh, and uh, Guildford Road with the council? Um, we would have an, uh, a relationship with RSLWA rather than with the Eastern Region. 
um, as they're the owners of the land. So that, that would be our relationship, would be not with the uh, Eastern Region, RSL, but with RSL WA. So I've got a question with that. So I met with Martin Holtzberger, who controls all RSL WA. So with now, they've been given agreement to deal with obviously the, the various parties, and obviously we controlling the RSL and Deputy Vice President. Okay. Um, we mentioned the site that Stuart Dawkins on that day that they came to block improving it, putting in like a park garden scene and all that kind of stuff. So we were just thinking like until we certified or agreed with that, we didn't want to spend money on it until we... Yeah, Mr. I, I can answer a bit. Okay, okay, you can answer, yeah. yes. Sorry, Luke, yes, thank you very much for, for the questions this evening. Um, um, the town did write to the, uh, to the uh, RSL at the brunch yeah. and uh, re we received a response from them on Monday, which I was going to be forwarding to councillors this coming um, Friday at the council's bulletin. Um, so um, there was some feedback that we received which was talking about the, the RSL lot where you are now and um, they've indicated that the uh, I would, look, I would basically suggest you go back to the RSL, the main branch, and actually have some discussions with them. Uh, talking about it through this process. Yeah. And it, thanks for your questions, but it might be worth having a conversation with um, some of the staff members outside of the council meeting, so some of these can be fleshed out a little bit more. So thank you for raising them with us. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr Kay. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Bruce Kay, 11 Earls Ferry Court, Bassendean. My question relates to item 10.9 <coughs> on the agenda, which is the quarterly report. Uh, those are looking at attachment 7 in the uh, attachments. And uh, I, I was reading it to see all the things in there. And down in uh, objective 3.3, I find a report on the winding up of town planning scheme 4A in which it says, no action this quarter. Now, some months ago, Council resolved to wind up Scheme 4A, and there was something like a 12-month program which was needed to sort out bits of land, sell land, build a bit of footpath and do other things. My question to Council is, if nothing was done in the last quarter, what is planned to be done this quarter? Would you like to answer that, Mr Reid? Nothing. <coughs> Possibility of a little bit of land acquisition associated with the footpath that's been constructed in Hutton Court. So, I suppose it, I don't know if it's the Court of Plan or Strategic Plan, there was a proposal to look at winding up town planning scheme for I think, over the next three years. Um, I was away when that went through. And I know there's, there's only about ten thousand dollars in this year's budget towards downtown school for I think um, you've previously raised a similar question and I think at that time I advised that Council made the decision for, that for the next financial year we weren't going to be allocating funds for the purchase of properties that would be required to wind up um, town planning scheme 4A in the current economic climate. No, thank you, Your Worship. Well, in return, I might advise you that uh, I've consulted with my doctor who suggests that I've got 22 years of l life left <laughs> and therefore every month I will ask the question for the next 22 years <laughs> until it's done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kay. <laughs> Ms Jacobson. Sorry. Oh, hi, Nonny Jacobson, Spartan Parade, Bassendean. Um, I've just uh, got a short question about item, I think it's 11.7 about the bins. About the bins? Yeah. yeah. Um, as part of that system, has the council considered supplying residents with um, reduced cost or discounted compost bins that they can use at home or worm farms that they can use at home in conjunction with an education program? So um, also on the agenda tonight are the minutes of the sustainability committee meeting. Um, and you might be aware that Council allocated uh, $10,000 for various programs for that committee. Um, on the recommendations from that committee for tonight's agenda is um, funding, allocating some of that funding towards not only subsidising um, worm farms, bakashi bins and compost bins, but also the provision of workshops. Um, so if that gets passed by Council tonight, the idea would be that residents would be able to attend one of those workshops and then be subsidised to purchase one of those three items relating to the workshop they've attended. 
And, and are those workshops the like the EMRC ones that um, the town can probably get well, cheap or free? Yeah, so we've also joined the Switch Your Thinking program, which provides some of those workshops as well. So yeah, we'll be working with those organisations. Thank you. Mr Johnson? You're next, Mrs Dwyer. So just before, so councillors, that's 15 minutes. Would someone like to move to extend public question time? Moved, Councillor Wilson, seconded, Councillor Hamilton. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Uh, Moss Johnson, six Barton for eight, Bass and Dean. Um, I'm actually not gonna ask a question about the strategic plan. Um, this question is regarding the proposed men's sheet, which I know is not on the agenda. I'm just bringing up some questions about designs that I've seen. And with utmost respect for members of the men's shed, um, and it's a great location, and it's, I'm really glad that they've got that location. And I have no desire to see any delays whatsoever. And I look forward to using it when I'm you know, in that headspace. I've currently got a shed. I use lots of industrial sheds. Um, However, I see it, it's A, it's a long-term asset to the town of Bassendine, and B, men's sheds are about good, good men's health, which to me is not just about the storage of machinery, um, but also the location that it's in. And it's, that's a perfect location with a good view over what my understanding is a small bit of drain that it's currently slated as a possible li uh, drains to living streams. It's part of a lot of the drains in that area with our current water minister. Um, and the current design basically involves through filling and the where the building is placed, the felling of most of the trees on that block. And my understanding is that through the design VASO committee that I'm in, that we are trying to promote designs that throughout Bassendine that enhance the urban forest and it you know, and I can't really see that as a town asset that that follows, the current design follows that. And also, a corrugated iron shed, when the machines are on, when you put a 24 inch Watkins thickness are on in that shed, it is going to be deafening. So then you go sit out the back and you're going to hear it straight through the corrugated iron as well and it's going to be deafening. So instead of sitting out the back, looking at the trees and the living stream and having a cup of tea while somebody thicknesses a whole lot of timber, it, it's not. So in terms of mental health, so my question is, are uh, those kinds of design considerations, which I know are part of the direction that we're supposed to be going in terms of our town assets and our development, um, being considered in the design for the men's shed? So you ask a very complicated question, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I'm not sure I can give um, I was you know, an adequate answer. I was going to comment time, actually, but, <laughs> but then I've read that a comment had to be things on the agenda, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so you, you are correct. Like the, this, we have a site for the shed, and the current location for the shed on that property does require fill and the removal of trees. And you are also correct that the direction that the town is seeking is to try and retain as many trees as possible. Um, you're probably also aware that there's a very long history of this project, so it's yes. 10 plus years. Um, and the group of men who have been very determined in their pursuit of a, a shed are getting to the point where they, they just want to see something happen. Um, and so you'd be aware that earlier this year um, the staff have sought quotes for the construction of a shed and those quotes do <coughs> relate to a tin shed as you have described. Um, and my understanding is that when the staff have previously sought quotes for other construction methods, it was prohibitively expensive, which is the reason why they have landed on this form of construction. Um, and with that form of construction, it's severely limited where you could put it on the block because you couldn't put it against the, the boundary because the building wasn't fire rated and various other factors. Um, I'm sure you've had some conversations with Councillor Hamilton, um, who has been a very strong advocate of the shed and finding solutions, and not only solutions, but the best possible solutions. And as a councillor, we've been very mindful of trying to balance the needs of the men who are desperate to have a shed and have that shed soon. and getting the best outcome that we possibly can in terms of the asset for the town and the amenity around that asset. Um, the men, and I don't want to speak for them, but my understanding is that there are concerns about us seeking other alternatives given the length of time that there have been changes in direction in this project. 
However, we, there have been some discussions about ways that we could possibly potentially do a joint tender where without delaying the project we could look at alternative forms of construction but that's still something that's there's been no decision made about that but we're, we're aware of the comments that you're making and they are concerns that we have as well but we also need to balance the needs of the men and um, the 10 year history of this project so it's something that um, I'm sure we'll have some discussions with our new CEO in the, in the near future. Yeah I don't wish to see any delays but I also think that as somewhere that's nice to be, that's positive for men's mental health, um, that we make design decisions that are for the long term and not just because we can quickly and easily build the tin shed. Yeah, I understand your point. I think the quickly and easily building a tin, sh a tin shed would be more relevant if we were at the start of a, <coughs> a project, not 10 years down the track, I, and that's I'm the complicating factor at this point. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, I appreciate that's your comments. Mrs. Dwight? Mrs. Dry. Thanks for being here tonight, Michael. Good night. Thank you. You can see I have my disabilities. One is hearing, and it's not much better tonight. Um, I don't know where I read this, but if somebody wants to uh, bring Walter Road down to two lanes of traffic and put in trees. Uh, I can't see how that's going to help the ratepayers, businesses, or even anyone wanting to come into Bassendine. Lord Street also doesn't need trees down the centre of it either. What you really need to look at, and some of you I know live in Success Hill, you've only got one entrance in and out. That needs to be looked at before anything else. And the other one is to get railway parade only turning left in and left out. You wouldn't get the congestion on the bridge and it would be much safer. If you needed an ambulance or a fire brigade, God help you. So just in response to your questions, um, you might be aware that the town has recently been undertaking an integrated transport study and um, Mr Dowling <laughs> has been very involved in that and so some of the recommendations that you're referring to in relation to the upgrades to Walter Road and Lord Street have come directly from recommendations from the consultant. Um, so there have been some decisions made um, from, by council in relation to those two roads to reflect those recommendations and you're right those recommendations for Walter Road relate to reducing it to a single lane of traffic making it more pedestrian bike friendly and having some trees to increase the safety but also to increase um, to make it more walkable um, the capacity of that road is currently limited by the single lane roundabout so it's not going to affect um, the ability for that road to carry traffic because it's already limited by that the location of that roundabout. Um, in regards to the Success Hill access um, and the railway parade, there are also items that are considered in that study and there are recommendations around the access to Success Hill. But um, when's that study going to be com coming to council for endorsement? Sorry, Mr Dowling. Um, they're still uh, working through a draft. Um, it may be towards the end of November or early December at this okay. stage, I think. Yeah. Is that answer your question. Uh, the other thing is, do you know one of the traffic lights is lying in the garden down there at the end of Walter Road? It's been there since the weekend. So Mr Stuart so Dawkins is nodding. Eyes on the so street. That, yeah, he's aware of that, so I'm sure that's being attended to. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. You're very good at picking all those things up in the community. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Further questions? I almost forgot your name there, Mr Yates. Sorry, please come forward. Thank you. Uh, Don Yates, 10 Thompson Road, Success Hill. Uh, just a couple of quick questions if I may. Uh, when assets are improved, and I guess this question is more for Mr. Simon Stewart Dawkins, when assets are improved around the town, do we ensure compliance with the Australian standards where applicable, and also that the uh, third party insurance is taken care of at that time? So Mr. Stewart Dawkins? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, a second question is, do you know who owns the Lord Street Bridge? Yes, the Department of Transport is responsible for the bridge. No, I said who owns the Lord Street Bridge. Uh, incorrect. The town of Bassendine owns the Lord Street Bridge and with that comes a potential insurance issue uh, in discussion with the transport in the last two weeks.
they've indicated that the town of Bassendine owns the Lord Street Bridge and I just make warning that from a third party insurance point of view, compliance with Australian Standard 100, uh, because it was road, you know, covered with a new mix recently, it actually then triggers the compliance with Australian Standard 5100. So there are a couple of issues here. One I think is the non-compliance of the bridge with Australian Standard 5100. And the second one is, I don't know if there's insurance held by the town for public liability for the bridge. And if you really want another Granville type disaster, you only have to see some kids put rocks in the track after half, you know, after half past 12, any sort of particular night, derail the train, the disaster that would cause on Bassendine is unreal. You need to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So that's another 15 minutes of public question time. Was there anybody who still had a question that they haven't had the chance to ask yet? Okay, so then we'll move on to item 2.2, which is addresses by members of the public. So if you have a specific <coughs> comment you'd like to make on one of the agenda items tonight, um, now is your opportunity. Okay, so moving on to item three, attendances, apologies and applications for leave. So we have an apology from Mr Costarella, the Director of Corporate Services, who is on leave, and we have Mr Ken Lapham here in his place. So thank you for being here, Ken. Any others? No. Any applications for leave, councillors? Um, okay, so moving on to item four, which is deputations. Mr Yates, I believe you wanted to give a deputation on items 5.1, 10.2 and 10.5. I may. Yes, you may. So you, as you know, you have a maximum of 10 minutes and then councillors can ask you questions. Right, I'll talk very quickly. No, no. Um, 5.1 just concerns the minutes of, the, of council meetings. Uh, at the last council meeting, I asked the question, the first question, was does the community and the council understand that when people ask questions, they ask it for four E's. It's an inquiry as to information, for education, for examination as to whether the councillors are aware of certain information, and sometimes also for entertainment. Um, that question was not answered, and I just find that disappointing that that wasn't in the minutes from last meeting. Okay, moving on. Uh, when we look at... Uh, 10.5, which is a, you're looking at the contract for graffiti removal. Um, I think this question, or this particular motion should be deferred until you get the various tenders to actually answer a couple of questions. Um, the tenderers should actually be qualified, or should be licensed uh, painters. Uh, I think you might find that some of the tenderers are not licensed painters. Um, two, you know, when it comes to, uh, uh, I guess, graffiti generally, the, um, we actually have an issue at the moment in our street where the 150-year-old Morton Bay Fig, heritage listed, uh, has, was adorned with purple paint. Now, the current people who have the contract graffiti force went to adjunct professor Paul Barber, also of Arbor Carbon, to find out the best, best way to actually remove that particular paint. All right? So it didn't kill the tree. <coughs> now, you've got a 150-year-old Morton Bay Fig plus plus. I think before you actually award the contract for three years, I think you need to examine, you know, from the various tenderers, how they would actually treat this particular tree. It's a case, you know, a case study. You know, for the sake of another month, I think it's worthwhile. In the item of 10.2, when we're talking about residential density and related services like that, I take the point that some of the um, descriptions and whatever are a bit of a work in progress. The Subiaco City Council, when they put together their Subiaco activity plan or activity centre plan, they made the inner city area of Subiaco uh, our activity centre zero. And then they put floor limits of six floors over it. And then they spent a lot of detail describing what you could and could not do in the activity centre. Now, what happened here in September last year, that the town passed, they changed the rezoning of inner city to our activity centre three. It's a residential zoning. Our activity centre through our activity centre zero is not a residential zoning. The community decides what goes into that area. In our activity centre three, you've limited to two to four floors. If you look through table one, of local planning scheme 10, you'll see there's a whole heap of reasons or things that you can't do in a residential area. You can't have a market, you can't have fast food, 
You can't have a tavern. Uh, what else can't you have? There's a number of them. There's two, almost two pages in table one. So all I'm saying is the zoning of the town centre and the shopping centre as our activity centre was, I believe, a mistake. And as part of looking at all the criteria to do with the zoning, the residential density services, you should need to look at RHC3 where you've zoned it. To give you an example, I spoke to a Hawaiian shopping centre and said, um, you've got at least three new shops there that have come on stream. Shop 68 and a couple of shops internally to the shopping centre. But when Hawaiian came back to me, they said Shop 68 was just a name change. They never defined what happened inside the shopping centre. So those two shops inside the shopping centre, like the bulk store, for example, could actually be illegal under REC3. Now, there is a contention between what is town centre, what is our activity centre 3. I've written the question to ask what is the difference, I get no answer. On the town's website it says, if you've got a question, please send it to me or please send it to the town at mail at bassendine.wa.gov.au. That's what I did. That question remains unanswered. I just want to know, what's the difference between town centre, whatever that means, and RAC3, which I do know. The other final question, I guess, or the final part of this deputation, uh, relates a bit concerning to one of the conditions inside what happened some years ago, because, look, I really wasn't interested in this stuff. It's only when I see triggers like the four-hour parking sign and people ask me questions, I go back and have another look. When you look at Amendment 1 that came out in November 2008, the Local Planning Scheme 10, it says the council will choose who may and who may not have high density in, town, in the town centre. That's a restraint of trade. That's illegal. Do you not realise this? All right. I only asked the question. I asked you to look at it closely. Any questions? So Mr Yates, um, a number of your points then were actually questions which if you'd stood up and asked them during public question time, I'm sure the staff will have, would have answered them for you. Just the question around town centre and RAC, I'm not sure whether Mr Reid or Mr Dowling would like to respond to that. <coughs> I think that Mr Yates asked, asked this question at the last council meeting and was advised by myself that the zoning for the town centre is town centre on the, the default density code for residential development within the town centre is RAC3. The town, I'll say it again, the town centre is on town centre and not residential. Okay. So, no, no, so uh, you, you finished your deputation, so now the opportunity is for councillors to ask you any questions on the points you've raised if they wish to do so. Is there anything that councillors would like to question Mr Yates about? Thank you for your time, Mr. Yates. Just, all I'm saying is you need to define the difference between town centre and REC3, which applies in the same area, and you have not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to item five, which is the confirmation of the minutes. So 5.1 is in re relation to the ordinary council meeting from September. So we have a mover for 5.1a, which is for the minutes to be received. Councillor Mikachuk, seconded by Councillor Brown. All those in favour? That is carried unanimously. And then item 5.1b, that they are confirmed as a true record. Do I have a mover, please? Councillor Wilson, seconded. Councillor Mikachuk, all those in favour? Councillor Brown, that's passed unanimously, I assume. Um, 5.2, this is in relation to the minutes of the special council meeting which was held on the 16th of October. That meeting was to receive the um, responsible authority report for the Vibe petrol station application and to make a recommendation to JDAP. So 5.2a is the, for the minutes of that meeting to be received. Do I have a mover? Councillor Mukachuk, seconder. Councillor Quinton, all those in favour? That is carried unanimously. And 5.2b, that those minutes are confirmed as a true record. A mover please, Councillor Brown, seconded by Councillor McLennan, all those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Um, and just for the members of the public's information, both the um, Responsible Authority Report and the Council recommendation was to refuse that application, but the determination will be made by the JDAP here on the 31st of October at 4pm next week. Um, item 6, announcements. Um, so I have a couple of announcements this evening. Um, first of all, some of you might be aware that the town was honoured to win the 
So 2018 winner of the Organisational Achievement Award for a large organisation for the Towns Youth Services Ride Program. Mr Haggard, I'm not sure whether you'd like to make any comments about that at all, but it's a great achievement, especially for the, the youth services staff who've done a wonderful job with this program. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we're very proud of the Ride Program, which is initiated by our youth services, our own local youth services. Um, it is now being taken up um, under licence by a number of other local governments um, and we are receiving a commission um, from those licences that are being issued and there's even interest now being shown interstate. Ballarat is, uh, is expressing interest in uh, taking up the program. Um, it's a project that was uh, initiated, developed and implemented by our youth service and we're very proud of the outcome. Thank you very much. So um, please pass on our congratulations to Greg and Aidan in particular for their, for their hard work with that program. It's really outstanding. Um, next, um, I have the pleasure of signing um, the Refugee Welcome Zone Declaration. So some of you might be aware that at the previous council meeting, um, council resolved to again recommit to be a Refugee Welcome Zone. Um, so a Refugee Welcome Zone is a local government that's made a commitment to the spirit of welcoming refugees into our community, to upholding the human rights of refugees and demonstrating compassion for refugees um, within our community. And there are a number of um, initiatives that the town is hoping um, to put in place. For example, we're planning on screening, I think it's called the Staging Post, um, in the 2018-19 outdoor cinema um, season. So this is a, a movie which is about two um, Afghan refugees and their, their struggle, um, especially after Australia stopped the boats and tells their story. And we're also hoping to again um, present the excellent photo exhibition that the library previously held in conjunction with that. Um, we're also hoping that this can be the start of other activities where members of our community who are refugees may be able to take part um, to promote um, employment of refugees, contacting refugee advocacy groups and doing what we can to make the town as an inclusive place as possible. So I've got the declaration certificate here. So it says this, the declaration is a commitment in spirit to welcoming refugees into our community upholding the human rights of refugees, demonstrating compassion for refugees and enhancing cultural and religious diversity in our community. So I'll sign that now. Um, and that's, I'm really proud to be part of a community that does value everybody and that the contribution of each individual um, is really important. It's what makes Bassendean such a wonderful place. Um, I'll do the date on that later. And finally, the last announcement. Um, Again, some of you may have been aware because there's been some media attention around it. The town of Bassadeen has been selected to partner with the Boomerang Alliance to deliver their Communities Taking Control project, which is essentially around assisting um, the town, but particularly our business owners, to reduce dependency on single-use plastics. So this is a fully funded um, position where we will have somebody working through the Boomerang Alliance with um, particularly local businesses in the community um, to assist them to make the transition in an economical way and promote the local businesses that are really making efforts for more sustainable practices. So that's a really exciting initiative um, and I think the town will get a great deal of promotion around this and I'm really looking forward to having um, that person on board working with our, with our local businesses to make um, that change in our community. Okay, so moving on to item seven is petitions. I don't believe we've received any this month. No. Um, item eight is declarations of interest. Do any councillors have items they wish to declare an interest in? Councillor Look at you. Yeah, I'm just going to declare an impartiality interest for item 10.12, just with my relationship to Christina Kerry, who's the chair of Eden Hill. Um, Thank you. Any other declarations? <coughs> okay. Um, item 9, there was no business deferred, so moving on to item 10. So councillors, these are the items that I currently have coming out of envelope. Please let me know if there's anything else that you would like taken out. So I currently have item 10.2, 10.3, 10.5, 10.6 been withdrawn, 10.7, 10.8, 10.12, 10, 10, 10.15, 10.18, 10.19, 11.1, 11.2, 11.3, 11.4, 11.5, 11.6 and 11.7. Are there any others that councillors wish to withdraw? Sorry, Mr Reid? Apologies, but 10.4 needs to be withdrawn. Okay, thank you. For the purpose and effect. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. No, 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 10.4. Oh, yes, you're correct. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Any further <coughs> items? 
Okay, well in that case, do I have a mover to adopt the remaining items on block? Councillor Quinton has moved, seconded by Councillor Hamilton. All those in favour? And that is So we'll move on to item 10.2. Are there any questions for the staff in relation to this item? It's the density scenarios um, and design principles. No questions? Yes, no questions. Councillor Brown? I noticed in the uh, diagrams from Mr. Dowling that there's no longer any reference to that area to the northwest of the Ashfield train station. Is that right? Or is that misinterpreting? There's no, there's no density changes shown there on the north side of the railway line. Uh, is that what you're referring to? Uh, yes, in earlier versions there was an indication that some of that area to the northwest of Ashfield train station was to be included in uh, the future plans for uh, the 3.5, Perth Peel 3.5. Yeah, there was a council resolution I recall about uh, looking at possibly live work developments, um, but I that hasn't been included at this stage yet because that probably needs to be worked through in more detail as yet. And also, we had a um, the council resolved to contact the minister and, and inform her about um, we get seek clarification about that activity centre extending over there in the minister's reply, which I think was tabled at the council meeting. Uh, she indicated a preference for the development to be to the south side of the railway line. So in light of that, that's what it reflects. Thank you very yeah. much. So just to clarify as well, these are very much draft documents yeah. that we're looking at going out for public consultation. So um, there's a lot of scope for changes to be made based on feedback. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so we had a question earlier on um, from one of the members of the public in attendance uh, asking for consideration to be given to extend the consultation. Do you imagine that there would be any uh, difficulties created in the programming if we were to extend the period of public consultation? Um, I don't have an issue with it. Um, it may push our program back slightly, but there is no legislator or statutory time frame that we need to adhere to in this case, so it's that council's prerogative. So um, during question time, Mr Peterson, um, Mr Pearson, sorry, <laughs> your first name and your surname confused. Mr Pearson was asking questions around Council's intention to extend public the, the consultation around this. Um, and I indicated that I'd had some discussions with um, CEO and Mr Dowling around um, deferring, putting this out to public con consultation at this point. Um, Basically, this is a priority project of the town. I know during the briefing session, there was some discussion around the messaging, um, the detail around some of the design principles and so on. Um, so if councillors don't have any further questions, I'd like to move essentially a deferral motion um, so that we're deferring this item subject to a workshop um, where we can um, to, to make some decisions around that messaging, around um, the time frame for consultation and so on. So. Um, I'd like to move that motion. If there's a seconder, Councillor Wilson. Sorry, Councillor Hamilton. Is there anybody against that? All those in favour? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you, Mr Dowling. Um, item 10.3, the adoption of the Bassingdean Beekeeping Local Law. Are there any questions for the staff on this item? Sure. Okay, so we have an officer recommendation. Do we have a mover for that recommendation? Councillor Brown? Can someone just check that Kath's okay? Um, and a seconder, Councillor Mikachuk. Um, all those in favour? And that is carried unanimously and by an absolute majority. Okay, item 10.4. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay, item 10.4, this is the local laws review. Um, so the Local Government Act requires that the person presiding at the council meeting give notice to the meeting of the purpose and effect of any proposed local laws. Um, so the parking local law that is proposed, the purpose of the proposed par parking local law is to one, constitute a parking region, two, enable the town of Bassendine to regulate the parking of vehicles within the parking region, and three, provide for the management and operation of parking facilities provided by the town of Bassendine. 
The effect of the proposed parking local law is that persons parking a vehicle within the parking region are to comply with the provisions of this local law. So we're also dealing with a new dogs local law. So the purpose of the proposed dogs local law is to provide for the management of dogs within the town of Bassendean in relation to containment, number of dogs at a premise and excreta. The effect of the proposed dogs local law is that dog owners within the town are to comply with the provisions of this local law. Do councillors have any questions? Councillor Mikichuk? Not a question. Uh, a deferral motion. Deferral motion of the, do of the laws? Yeah. Okay, do we have a seconder for the deferral motion? No, so that Sorry, can I ask what the purpose sure. of the deferral motion is? Yeah, Thank certainly. You. In regards to the deferral motion, it's because the Dog Act 1976 is currently being reviewed by the state government, has gone out to consultation, so I think it would be a bit premature at a local level um, to do that simultaneously, and I think it would be better decision-making process to wait until the state act has been finalised and then um, look at amending or changing the local law after that. So, Counts, um, Mr Stuart Dawkins, are you going to make a comment on that? Uh, no, not at this time. No. Uh, okay. I, think, um, I wasn't aware of that was going to be deferred, so okay. uh, I point that it to this. Uh, so, um, and you may not be able to answer this question, but has there been consideration given to the, um, to, what did you say, sorry, the Dog Act 1976 being? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, no. No, okay. So, Councillor Mikachuk, I'm aware that there's two local laws here being considered. Yeah. Um, are you proposing we defer both of them or just the dog local law? Uh, I was going to for ease, but really my concerns are more around that the State um, Act is currently under review. So my concerns aren't really around the, the parking, unless someone else So, um, would councillors like to consider the two items separately then? So maybe we can do an item 10.4a, which... Um, and deal with the parking local law and then we can do an item 10.4b relating to the dog local law. Yes? Okay, so item 10.4a which is in relation to the proposed parking local law. Do we have a mover for the officer recommendation for that item? Councillor Gangel, is there a seconder? Councillor Hamilton, all those in favour? That is carried unanimously. So, mm -hmm. Councillor Mikachuk, you've made a deferral motion for item 10.4b. Now that she's given an explanation, is there a seconder for the deferral motion? Councillor Quinton, is there anybody against? All those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, item 10.5, this is the provision of the graffiti removal surfaces. Are there questions um, for the staff in relation to this item? Uh, yes. Um, Simon, I did ask if we could get a report uh, back to us about hotspots. I just wanted to know where that would be at um, and if it's something that would come back and how that would work on a regular basis. I just wanted to understand the administration of it. So a graffiti happens, the ranger is notified, we get the timber in. Does that go into a bank? Can you just explain that? Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Um, since since the inquiry was made last week, we've actually run a report and um, and obtained all that, that data. And there's been discussions between our asset services team and our recreation and culture team in regards to uh, potentially identifying uh, or potentially reviewing those hotspots to see whether there's an opportunity for for uh, public art to be placed at those locations. At this stage, because that was only last Tuesday, at this stage we haven't gone any further than that. But that's that's where we're currently at. We need to go out and actually look at each of the sites individually and determine whether there's a, a, a whether they're appropriate to have public art on um, And you know, sometimes the you know, sometimes the, the tags are maybe a large a large tag there, which is a one-off. Other ones have been you know a, a regular regular hits. So we're doing some analysis of the data. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Hamilton. Um, question through the chair for the officers. Um, I'm assuming these tender prices are for um, per site cleaning. It's, and there's an average given, but it is per site. So in other words, if we actually attend to some of these sites and put public art in the future, and it reduces the amount of graffiti happening in the town, I'm assuming that you know the, the, the usage of this tender person would go down. 
Yes, it's a, it's a square meter rate, rate and uh, the contractor provides us with images of the of the um, of the uh, graffiti paper, yep. and those reports are uh, posted to the WA Police, and then are used for any prosecutions in the future as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have an officer recommendation. Um, Councillor Quintanilla, you had flagged potentially adding a point to that. Are you? No, I think no? if the report's okay. underway, I don't need to. Sure. Okay, so do we have a mover for the officer recommendation? Councillor Brown, so a second to Councillor Quinton. Anyone against? All those in favour? That is carried unanimously and by an absolute majority. Um, 10.6, as I said, has been withdrawn from the agenda. So moving on to 10.7, it's the re review of delegations to the CEO. Councillor Hamilton, I believe you have some questions on this item. Uh, yes, I do. Just... <clears throat> okay. On page 30 of the agenda, 1.3, permission to extend lease buildings. Um, this looks like it's permission to extend the actual building footprints and uh, given most of our lease buildings are on reserves, I would prefer that that sort of thing comes to council because we have such a great love of preserving our green spaces. Um, so is Councillor Hamilton's understanding of that delegation correct? I'm not sure it's if I agree in that. I would say that it, it, it's generally used not for major building works, but if you think of a, a building like, it could, Tartworth would be an example, that's a lease building. If they want to put some extra storage space on there, then we would approve that. So it's a lease building, it's, it's a private lease, it's generally not on reserves. And I would say it's really an administrative matter, and the delegation is there as long as the development approval has been issued, and there's no increasing costs to come. And Mr. Reid, would I be correct in thinking that if anything that was potentially contentious was coming up, then you would bring it to council? I'm sure, with the new chief executive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I do have another one. Item one point nine on page thirty-one. I spoke to uh, Mr. Haggart today. It's got their uh, policy 613, but I think we agreed that that should be amended to 611. <coughs> Is that correct, Mr. Haggart? That's, that's, correct. that's right, okay. Um, and then we've got 2.3 lease agreement, Bastine Men's Shed Association. That seems to relate to the old lease agreement but I'm not entirely sure on that one so I was going to ask the question on that. Uh, yeah certainly that relates to um, the lease that was negotiated at the previous site that's correct. So that shouldn't be in there? Um, the the men share of the view that we've negotiated a lease that they're comfortable with um, that they would be looking to largely replicate with the new site. Okay I think I think a lease agreement that's for a site which is not the site that we are now dealing with is not a valid document in all terms, legal terms. You couldn't possibly transfer the terms of one lease for a, a parcel of land to another parcel. Yeah. It, it just, it's just not normal to yeah, do no, that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we certainly would need to be amended to accommodate the new site. But um, in terms of the um, covenants under the lease, it's about the management of the building and the relationship with the town and the user of the building. So, um, as the new CEO, um, I'm not sure if you'd like to make a comment on how your, your approach to that. I, I, I think, um, given the points that you've raised, Councillor Hamilton, it'd be worth bringing the lease back to Council for their approval rather than the discretion remaining with the CEO. Thank you. Further questions, Councillor Hamilton? Sorry, um, Councillor Wilson. No. Is that it? I Councillor Wilson might have had something. <laughs> Um, there's probably a question for staff, Your Worship, but I'm just wondering uh, historically how often the uh, delegations have been reviewed and reported on what's the sort of standard practice. Mr. Reid, putting his hand October up. every year. And um, just supplementary to that, so 
in October every year, the exercise of those delegations is recorded as a single group report at that time. I'm sorry, you might have misunderstood the question. Whenever an, an officer, like the chief exec, exercises delegation, he goes into a delegation register, and that delegation register is available for a councillor to be. Okay, so it's available for inspection, but it doesn't form a part of a regular reporting process. I don't yeah. think so. No. Okay. Thank you. Just obviously the planning and building determinations are reported to it. And then we have some items in here in the report under point six that record some of the other delegations that have been um, exercised. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, a question is directed to item 3.5, disposal, disposal of property listed in the annual budget. I have no problem with this, provided there are checks and balances. The question is, are these transactions detailed anywhere in our annual report? or in some other document that is publicly available. When I say transactions, complete transactions, the unit costs, total uh, value of sales, and those that successfully tended to purchase our property. Uh, yes, through the Chair, yes they are. And there's a, it's put out as a tender, and so that means that the report would come back to this council for, uh, for um, approval of the, of the people who made application to tender the particular item. So it might be a piece of furniture, or it might be an old piece of uh, office equipment that is that is, uh, that is no longer required, and so that would be put out to tender, and then a report would come back to this council to uh, consider. Well, come back to, just to clarify, the report would come